the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on your husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. The weather out of Oregon had been rough, and it wasn't until the steamship Portland approached the dock at Skagway that the passengers could come on deck. A young man whose clean-cut features were alight with eagerness stood beside an older man whose clerical collar marked him as a minister. Side by side at their feet were two pieces of luggage of very similar design. The boy grinned as he looked at the bags, then turned to the man next to him. Excuse me, sir, but hmm? you're a minister, aren't you? That's right, son. Peterson's my name. Mine's Bob Kelly. Well, I'm glad to know you. I noticed you as we came aboard ship. <laughs> I noticed <laughs> you too, Reverend. Fact is, the steward almost gave you my bag instead of your own. Oh? <laughs> we must have bought our luggage in the same shop. Well, did you get yours in Seattle? Yes, did you? Yes. <laughs> my old one was about to fall apart, and I needed a bag with a sturdy lock on it for this trip. I've got most of my money in mine. We do have a lot in common. Are you going to Alaska or the Yukon? I'm heading for Dawson. Hey, we're docking. Yes, but it'll be a few minutes before we're able to go ashore. So this is Skagway. Do you know anything about Dawson, Reverend Peterson? Well, I know the town very well. I lived there for years. Now I'm going back to build a church. But uh, what about you, Bob? Are you intending to look for gold? No, I'm going to try to prove something to my dad. My father is uh, Horace Kelly. Oh, the newspaper publisher? You've heard of him? Well, he's very well known. He's too well known. I figure I'm old enough to be on my own, but Dad wants me to go to college and study journalism. Well, how old are you, Bob? Eighteen. I'm an artist. Dad admits I'm pretty good, and he's offered to get me a job. But I want to make my own reputation without trading on his. How do you plan to do it in the Yukon? <laughs> it's a colorful place, isn't it, Reverend Peterson? <laughs> I guess you could call it that. Yeah, right. Jack London and Bob Service are there getting material for books. Uh, I ought to be able to get material for my work. Maybe I can get a job in a newspaper, cartooning or something. Well, I wish you luck, Bob. And if you need help, look me up. I know quite a few people in town. That's kind of you, then. I want to make my own way. Dad said as soon as I spent my money, I'd cable him. I want to accomplish as much as I can without help. Keep in touch with me anyway. I may need the services of a good artist to sketch plans for the church. I'll look you up as soon as I'm settled. <laughs> Get in place, in place. Hey, what are we waiting for? Come on, let's go. Well, Bob, <laughs> you better pick up your bag. There are no porters in Skagway to carry it for you. Gee, this doesn't look like much of a town. Does You'll it? find it different from Seattle. Well, goodbye, Bob. So long, Reverend. Passengers on the steamship Portland swept past Bob on the deck as they surged down the gangplank from the boat to the dock. In the excitement, Reverend Peterson picked up Bob's bag instead of his own. And with the confusion, Bob didn't even notice it. Hey there, young fella. You figure I'm going back home? No, sir, I'm going to Skagway. Then you'd better hustle and get on. All right. <laughs> Bob gripped the bag Reverend Peterson left beside him. And then he was caught in the mob. He looked for his friend, the minister, and saw him hurrying down the gangplank. Unknown to Reverend Peterson, two men waited on the dock for him. Two passengers from the steamship Portland who had murder in their hearts. It was several weeks later when Sergeant Preston reported to Inspector Maynard at Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson. Oh, uh, sit down, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. Where's King? He's outside waiting for me, sir. Did you learn anything important about Peterson's murder while you were in Skagway, Sergeant? I didn't learn much, Inspector. Came in on the steamship Portland. He must have been killed soon after landing. He was up in the Portland there. That's a curious coincidence. How's that, sir? Son of a friend of mine came to Skagway on the same boat. Oh? Two confidence men were passengers on the Portland, too, sir. 
Apparently, they caused quite a bit of trouble during the trip. What kind of trouble? Usual kind, crooked card games. Who are they, Sergeant? On the passenger list, they were listed as Jim Loomis and Sam Norton. I haven't heard of them before. They're not wanted for anything, sir. I understand they were heading for Dawson. Well, do you think that they're connected with Peterson's death? I've been thinking along that line, but I can't report anything definite. Oh, you have no clues then, Sergeant? No, sir. I know Peterson was carrying a large sum of money to finance a church here in town, but neither the money nor his luggage can be found. Have you released the news of the murder to the public? Not yet, sir. Of course, people are coming to Dawson from Skagway every day. Someone will probably bring word of it with them. I wish we could keep the story quiet for a while. Yes, it would make it easier for me to continue my investigation. I don't want Loomis and Norton to know I'm looking for them. They assume other names. You'll have trouble finding them in Dawson. Yes, sir, I know. I'm watching for big spenders. They must have Peterson's money. Keep working on the case, Sergeant. And by the way, if you do see the boy I spoke of a few minutes ago, keep an eye out for him, will you? Of course, sir. What's his name? Bob Kelly. His father's Horace Kelly, an old friend of mine. Newspaper publisher in the States, isn't he? Yes, I have a cable from him here. He wants us to see that Bob stays out of trouble and, if necessary, lend the boy money to come home. He says, I'll reimburse you, and so on and so on. He must be quite worried about his son. Boy, sounds like he's the chip off the old block. Sergeant, did I ever tell you about the time Horace and I were on Cemetery Ridge at uh, Gettysburg? No, sir. It's quite a story, Sergeant. If young Bob has a fraction of his father's courage, he'll be all right. I'll watch for him, sir. Good. I'd be willing to bet my commission that he wouldn't ask for help no matter how much he needed it. And if Horace mentioned my name to him, he'd probably do his best to keep me from learning about his circumstances. If the boy needs money, sir, he could cable his father. Uh, I think he'd starve first. From this cable, I get the impression that Bob's out to prove himself to his dad. I hope he can do it. Well, that's all, Sergeant. If you learn anything about the Peterson murder, let me know immediately. Very well, sir. Bob Kelly didn't know that the Mounties were aware of his presence in the Yukon. Shortly after leaving Skagway, he had nearly exhausted the small amount of money in his wallet. Knowing he had more in his suitcase, he wasn't worried until he tried to open the bag he had carried from the boat. When the key wouldn't spring the lock he realized that Reverend Peterson had picked up his bag and that the one he had carried belonged to the minister. Bob had had just a few dollars in silver when he reached Mrs. Kane's boarding house in Dawson. He inquired in several places about his friend, Reverend Peterson, but had learned nothing. He went to the local newspaper office looking for a job. Oh, I'm sorry, son, but I can't afford to hire help now. I'll work for almost nothing, Mr. Matthews, if you give me a chance. Oh, can't do it. I don't have the facilities now for printing pictures anyway. Maybe in a couple of months, things will be better. Come back. All right, Mr. Matthews, I'll do that. Bob's need for cash was immediate. He was hungry, and he had room rent to pay. He began making the rounds of every store in Dawson. Sorry, Kelly, I can use anyone without experience. I got all the swampers I need. We're not hiring anyone else. No, we don't need anyone. Can't use you, Kelly. Come back next week. Disheartened and discouraged, Bob turned toward Mrs. Kane's boarding house. He was desperately hungry. And as he opened the door and went inside, he thought longingly of his mother's cooking. Is that you, Mr. Kelly? Yes, Mrs. Kane. Come into the parlor a minute. I want to talk to you. Probably wants to collect the week's rent. Hope you got the mud and snow off your feet before you came in, young man. Oh, yes, Mrs. Kane. I, I did. Well, close the door. I want to talk private. My sakes, you sure look gaunted. You're not eating right. Uh, I guess maybe I'm not. Well, sit down. Thanks, ma'am. I suppose you see your bag over by my desk? No, I, I hadn't noticed it. You're putting me out? Can you pay the rent you owe me? I can't pay you now, Mrs. Kane. I don't have the money. Mm. That's what I thought. I'll take my bag and leave. I, I'm sorry, I, I promise that as soon as I get some cash, I'll pay Hey, it. hold I... on, young fella. Not so fast. You're not taking that bag anywhere. Uh-huh. I won't put you out. I'll let you stay another week. But I'm holding the bag for security. When I took it from your room this morning, I noticed it was still locked. Yes, it's locked. Didn't even unpack it, did you? No, I didn't. Oh, well, it's mighty heavy. Well, I'll keep it, and when you pay me what you owe, you'll get it back. Fair enough? That's fair enough, Mrs. Kane. Hope you can get a job real soon. Do you know Reverend Peterson here in town? I should say I did know him. Two hundred dollars of my cash is in the reward fund that's offered for his killer. Did you say his killer? That's what I said. Some cold-blooded, heartless highwayman killed the reverend, made off with his baggage. 
And whoever did it knew about the money the Reverend was carrying to build the church here. What? Well, the whole town's been buzzing with the story ever since the Mounties released the news yesterday. I'm surprised you didn't hear about it. I guess I've been so busy looking for a job, I, I didn't pay much attention to anything else. The police are looking for the Reverend's baggage right now. They figure if they can find that, they'll have a lead on the killer. Oh, oh gosh. Hey, what's wrong? Here, my goodness, boy. You look like you're going to faint. No, I... Oh, that settles it. You come right into my kitchen. I'll see that you get a square meal. I figured by the looks of you, you were mighty hungry, but I sure didn't think you were weak with starvation. Come on, now. Mrs. Kane, that swell of you, and I... I appreciate it, but... Could I have that... That suitcase you're holding. I'm sorry, Bob, but I've made it a policy all my life not to extend credit without some sort of security. Now, if there's anything you've got to have, I'll let you get it. But I have to hold most of your stuff till you pay your rent. Now, come on into the kitchen. Bob Kelly had been stunned by the realization that the suitcase in Mrs. Kane's parlor was the one the Mounties sought. He appreciated his landlady's kindness and did justice to the hearty meal she placed in front of him. But Bob's mind was a turmoil of fear and uncertainty. He was scared. He wanted to free his mind of the knowledge that made him feel so guilty. But he felt that Mrs. Kane might suspect him if he told her the truth. In fact, he was afraid to tell anyone he had the missing suitcase until he had a chance to go to the law with it. But he couldn't take it to the Mounties until his rent was paid. As he pushed his chair back from the table, Bob didn't know what to do. Thanks very much for the meal, Mrs. Kane. Oh, that's all right. Hope you feel better now. I feel much better. Hey, where are you going? I just got an idea. Maybe I can make some money by drawing pictures of people in the cafe. Oh, I think you could. It's worth a try anyway. Bob got some paper and a pencil, and thus equipped, he visited the nearest cafe. He saw two grizzled old prospectors seated at a table. Glenn, that claim of mine is the nearest thing to pure gold I ever see. Now, listen, Pete. Your penny ante steak couldn't hold a candle to mine. The pay dirt I struck last week was... What do you want, kid? I thought you gentlemen might be interested in having your pictures drawn. Picture? Now, look here, kid. If you're being funny... Hey, hold, hold on, Lem. Kid, could you draw Lem's picture? Yes, I could. If you can draw that grizzled old buzzard there, I'll buy the picture. Pete, did you ever get a look at that ugly face of yours? But now, Lem, you know I'm a long sight better looking than you are. <laughs> we'll see about that. Now, kid, you draw Pete's picture just to prove what a homely critter he is. And I'll pay you for it. If you'll just sit still for a little while, I'll make sketches of both of you. Now, you'll see. <laughs> Under Bob's pencil, Pete's homely but good-natured face began to take shape on paper. The rest of the cafe's patrons gathered around to watch him work and from time to time made comments. The sourdough named Lem was highly amused. Well, you see this, Pete. It's a perfect image. Of it. <laughs> how, how much longer do I have to sit still? I'm finished now. Well, well let me see my picture. Here you are. Yeah. What? <laughs> what kind of a joke is this? This don't look no more like me than, than that caribou head on the ball. Right. I did the best I could. Uh, well, my eyes don't squint up like this. Like blazes they don't, Pete. You've been squinting away snow blindness for the last 15 years. So you think it's funny, huh? Well, now we'll just see what he does with your picture. Sure, sure. Go ahead, youngster. Don't pay any attention to Pete. He's just burned up because all this time he's been fancying himself a real good-looking cuss. <laughs> and the truth hurts him. <laughs> as Bob sketched Lem, the prospector named Pete sat glowering as he watched the boy's swift, sure pencil strokes. His frown gave way to a grin. When Bob finished the sketch, Pete was laughing heartily. But Lem's bellow of rage silenced his friend. I'll teach you to come in here and try to pass off an ugly-looking critter like that as a picture of me. You get out, kid. Go on, get out. Pay me my money and I'll get out willingly. You're going out anyway. Oh, no, you don't. Uh, oh. So you want to get rough, huh? All right. Uh, uh, Lamb, you knocked the kid down. Now, Lamb, don't be such a sore head. Uh, let him get out if he don't want to fight. I'll get out when I get my money. Hey, the kid's heading out. You, he was you, more you're a Welchon. You're trying to get out of paying what you promised. I said to get out. Oh, oh let up, Lamb. Let the kid alone. He's a game youngster. Say, Uncle Kid, now I'll let you go. You give me my money. Here's what I'll give you. Oh. 
Look, it's down again. Say, look there, a dog. Hey, where'd he come from? That's Sergeant Preston's dog. This king, he's standing right beside the kid. You, you going to get up for more kid, or will you leave here peaceful? I won't go till you pay up. What's going on here? It's Sergeant Preston. Here, let me help you. Thanks. I didn't make it. You all right? I guess so. You're a Mountie. Yes, Preston's my name. Those, those are sergeant stripes. Right, this is King. Hello, King. I'm Bob Kelly. Kelly, eh? Did you start this fight? Well, not exactly. With everyone talking at once, Sergeant Preston had difficulty getting the facts behind the fight. But when Pete and Lem showed the sketches Bob had drawn, the Mountie looked sternly at the two prospectors. As I understand it, you both told the boy to draw each other's pictures. That's right, Sergeant. But just take a look at this. Wouldn't you be insulted if somebody tried to tell you you looked like that? Pete, do you think this is a good likeness of Lem? Oh, sure it is, Sergeant Preston. Only you ought to see what the kid drew of me. Oh. Of course, I wouldn't have hit the kid for it, but I sure don't feel complimented. He ain't no artist. Lem, does this look like Pete? Well, it's the image of him. It's exactly him. What? No, you... <laughs> you two commissioned this boy to sketch your pictures. He kept his part of the bargain. Now you keep yours. Well, all right. I'll pay for Pete's, but not mine. I'll pay for you. By dern, I'd like to have it just to scare the daylights out of some pesky grizzly bears that have been getting into my ration. I'll pay up, both of you. Well, all right, I'll pay. Kid, I guess I owe you something a little extra. If the sergeant says it was wrong, I'm sorry I hit you. Well, that's all right. You don't have to. No, no, no. I want to settle up. I guess I was a sore head, but... Well, I don't believe I look like that. Sergeant Preston, with King at his heels, escorted Bob Kelly from the cafe, and Bob pocketed the money he had earned sketching. His newfound friend, the Mountie, didn't tell him he knew how much that cash meant. The newspaper publisher told me this morning that you've been in to see him, Bob. I've been to see almost every businessman in town trying to get a job. Oh. With the money from those two men, I can pay my rent now. Fine, Bob. When I'm paid up, I can get a bag Mrs. Kane's holding for me. Then I want to see you. I, I've got to explain something. Would you like to explain it now? No, uh, I'll do it later. Where will you be? Headquarters. I'll be there inside of half an hour. King and I will be looking for you. While Bob was engaged in his fight in the cafe, a man named Blackie Wilson, who had been a passenger on the steamship Portland hurried to a room in the Hotel Victoria. His partner, a tall, heavy-set man, was eyeing the contents of Bob Kelly's suitcase with a sour expression on his face. Get your park on, Craig. What for? This time, my checking up has got results. I know where Peterson's bag is. You're checking up. Huh. You checked up on Peterson before we killed him. You were the one that was so sure he was carrying a pile of money in his bag. When we open the bag, what do we find? A lot of drawn stuff belonging to a kid named Bob Kelly. Then you have to follow the kid to Dawson, and we're still... Shut up and listen. I found out where Bob Kelly's staying. So, uh, I also found out that the kid came into town with a suitcase just like, like that Like the one... one we took from Peter? Yeah. So, you see, I was right. The bag the kid's got must belong to the Sky Pilot. Then Kelly's got the cash. Yeah. We'll get Kelly and beat the truth out of him if we have to. He must have traded bags with the minister and fixed it so the two of them would meet in town. Oh, well, by this time, he knows Peterson's dead. All the more reason we gotta hurry. The kid might go to the Mounties or do some dumb thing like that. Now hurry up into that parka. Yeah. Well, where is Kelly? He's living in Mrs. Kane's boarding house at the edge of town. If we get the cash, we won't have to come back to this hotel. I'm all set, Blackie. Good. We'll stop and rent a sled and dog team in case we have to get away from town fast. And then, Craig, the two of us will be set. Maybe we will and maybe we won't. I still want to be shown that your checking up is right this time. When we get to Kane's boarding house, you'll see I'm right. Now, come on. Blackie Wilson and Thorne Craig hurried to Mrs. Kane's boarding house. The landlady talked to them in the parlor. And as soon as they saw the suitcase she had been keeping for Bob, they broke the lock. Ignoring her protests, Blackie went through the contents of the bag until he found a leather packet. <laughs> this is it, Craig. Look. Open it up. Yeah, but hold a gun on the old lady. A gun? Why, you thieves, you robbers, that bag belongs to Bob Kelly. Like fun it does, sister. Here's the money, Craig. Paper money. Thousands of dollars of good old American money. You were rich. Didn't I tell you that kid had Peterson's bag? Didn't I tell you that I checked? You were right, Blackie. I take it all back. You had this figured out to a T. Peterson's bag? 
Then, then that money belonged to Reverend Peterson. That's the church money. It's our money now, oh. lady. Hey, Blackie, look. Huh? Out the window, see? That Kelly kid's coming here. Coming on a run, too. We got the cash. There's no need to stay around here. Oh, what about the old lady? Quiet. The kid just opened the front door. Bob, run for your life. Get the Lord. Don't come in here. Shut up, you. Oh, two thieves are in here. Robbers. They've opened that suitcase. They've got guns. Get the law, Bob. Run. The kid's going for help, Blackie. Let him have it. <laughs> He's falling. You got him. Now let's get out of here. We got to go over and make sure the kid's dead. He got to look at us. You got the kid. I saw him fall. Now come on. Out the back way. It was some time later when Sergeant Preston and King arrived at Mrs. Kane's boarding house. Mrs. Kane told Sergeant Preston how Blackie and Craig had come asking for Bob, how she had talked to them in the parlor, and then how they had broken into the suitcase, taking from it a large sum of money. As she finished talking, Bob Kelly regained consciousness, and he began to talk. He told how Reverend Peterson had taken his bag by mistake when the minister left the boat. They must have learned where I live and then came Had here. you opened the bag? No. My key wouldn't spring the lock, Sergeant. That's how I first knew I had the wrong bag. Those two men knew the money was in it. Can you describe the men? Well, one was tall and heavy, and the other... Oh, I was so upset, I guess I can't remember. Bob, did you get a look at them? Yes, I saw them. Could you describe them, Bob? Or, better yet, give me a sketch of them. I think so, Sergeant. I'll get some paper and a pencil. As Bob quickly sketched two faces, Mrs. Kane stood by, nodding her head vigorously. That's exactly what they look like, Sergeant. Bob's done a good job. This one it was called Blackie, and the other one was Craig. Good. Let me have those sketches, Bob. Sure thing, Sergeant. But where are you going? King and I are going to try to find these men. Come on, boy. Your shoulder all right now, Bob? Oh, it's fine, Sergeant. Good. Take it easy for a little while, and you'll be all right. Bob, how do you suppose he'll find those men? I don't know. Bob, where are you going? I'm going to see if Sergeant Preston won't let me stay with him till he gets those two. But, Bob, those men are dangerous. They're... I'll be back, Mrs. Kane. Sergeant Preston had gone from one hotel to another, and in each one, he showed Bob sketches to the room clerks. No one recognized the men until he reached the Hotel Victoria. Uh, why, sure, Sergeant, I know these two. They're registered here as Blackie Wilson and Craig Thorne. Take me to their room. In the room Blackie and Craig had hurriedly left, Sergeant Preston found Bob Kelly's suitcase. He also found some clothing one of the men had thrown on a chair. Get this set, boy. We're looking for this man. Uh, that shirt belongs to Mr. Wilson, but your dog might care. He knows what I want him to do. You ready, boy? <coughs> then let's go. <coughs> the great dog king led Sergeant Preston from the hotel to a trace and harness shop two doors away. We, oui, oui, Sergeant. I recognize those two. They rented a team and slid from me for 24 hours. How long ago were they here? Uh, two, maybe three hours ago. Thanks. Come on, King. <laughs> Sergeant Preston left the shop with King at his heels. The Mountie went to police headquarters, where he found Bob Kelly waiting for him. As Preston harnessed his team, Bob pleaded with him. Take me along, Sergeant Preston. Please let me go with you. Bob, it may be dangerous. I know it. These but... two men may be more than thieves. Get around. Quiet. They may have killed Reverend Peterson. I'll stay out of the Bob, way. Bob, I haven't time to argue with you. Hop in my sled. You mean you'll let me go? Yes. All right, King. On King! On As Sergeant Preston's dogs covered the well-traveled trail out of Dawson, neither the Mountain nor Bob Kelly had any way of knowing that this was the route Blackie and Craig had chosen. But King, running ahead of the team, seemed confident that he was on the right track. One hour passed, and the great husky never slackened his pace. Two hours had gone by when Sergeant Preston noticed a subtle change in King's manner. Sergeant, are you sure they took this trail? From the way King's acting, I think we're not far behind them. Hey, look. There's a sled on the trail ahead. I can just make it out. I see it, Bob. King, gee, boy, gee! Why are you turning to the right? This is a shortcut. King, look to that up. Gee, boy, gee! Sergeant Preston's point dogs turned to the right. Then the swing dogs followed, but the two young intermediate dogs were slow. The great dog, King, nipped the nook's heels. That's it, boy. The Mountie sled turned from the trail, and King went back to his place at the head of the team. On King! On, you husky! A short time later, Blackie Wilson's rented dog team rounded a turn in the trail. Craig Thorne was riding in the sled, and it was he who first saw a big husky leaping down the side of a snow-covered embankment. What the... It was King. 
Blackie, that big dog's stopping the team. Mush you, Mutz, mush! He won't move. He's got him stopped. Yeah, I'll kill that husky. Don't reach for your gun. Hey, Blackie, there's a man coming down that slope. It looks like... Hey, it is. He's a Mountie. We'd better find out how much he knows. I'm keeping my gun handy. There's only one reason why he'd be stopping us. Hello, Blackie Wilson. How come you know who I am? Never mind that. Is this your dog? That's right. Well, what's the idea of stopping us? We're going to search you two. What for? Well, you got no I'm right looking to... for a leather packet belonging to Reverend Peterson. The packet contained American paper money. Well, you don't think that we... Steady, had... Craig. I got a gun here, Monty. And it says we're going on about our business. Going that gun was a mistake, Wilson. Yeah, that's what you think. Now get back, Monty. You're taking orders, not giving them, Wilson. Take him, gang! I'll get you! Oh, you don't! Go. Let go of my arm! Don't raise that gun! You're breaking my Let arm! Let the gun! I, Drop it! You, you win! Uh, Shoot this dog, King! Kill him! I, I can't, Blackie! All right, King, quiet, boy. On guard, fellow, while I search these two. King's bared fangs were a threat neither of the killers dared to ignore since they had seen the dog in action. They quietly submitted to being searched. Just as I thought, here's the leather packet with Tom Peterson's name on it. We found that folder in the There's money. There's an eyewitness in Dawson, a Mrs. Kane, who will testify that you stole it. Furthermore, I found the bag Reverend Peterson carried from the boat in your room at the Hotel Victoria. Blackie, you dumb muttonhead. You had this all figured out. Well, thanks to you, we'll hang for killing that sky pilot. Shut up, Craig, shut up! You're both under arrest in the name of the Queen. When Bob and Sergeant Preston returned to police headquarters in Dawson, Bob's father was with Inspector Maynard. The inspector was explaining to the newspaper publisher. Horace, our men haven't been able to locate either Sergeant Preston or your son. I don't give a hang about Preston. What about Bob? Preston has nothing to do with him. I assigned Preston the job of looking out for Bob. And now you can't find either of them. You're getting old, John, losing your grip. You should have gotten out of uniform at the end of the war instead of going into another outfit... You can't control your own men. You can't police a city the size of Dawson. Oh, Horace, I resent your words. Preston word. reporting, sir. Preston. Bob. Dad. Son, where have you been? Preston, what happened? Where Inspector, is... uh, Bob Kelly and I just brought in the two men who killed Reverend Peterson. Here's a full confession from them. We recovered Peterson's church fund, and the killers are behind bars awaiting trial. Well, Sergeant, did you say Bob assisted in making the arrest? That's right. Well, there's a $2,000 reward offered by the town for the capture of the killers. You're entitled to that reward, Sergeant Preston. You and King. Well, I suggest the reward be added to the fund Reverend Peterson raised to build a new church. An excellent idea, Sergeant. Yes, indeed. A fine idea. Now, what do you think of your son, Horace? Well, I'm mighty proud of him. Bob, I uh, came to Dawson to see how you were doing. I'm glad you came, Dan. Now we can go home together. <laughs> So you want to come home, huh? Yes, sir. I miss Mom's cookie. Say, Dad. Yes, son? When I get home, how about letting me write the story of this crime for the paper? Oh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, agreed. You'll get a byline. Oh, no. I'm, I'm <laughs> yes, son, I'll give you a byline. Sergeant Preston, I think there's more to this than you've told me. Well, Inspector, when you read my report, you'll have the whole story, including King's part in it. <laughs> That's right, fellow. Then this case will be closed. Now, here's Sergeant Preston with a preview of our next adventure, the case of the detective who liked excitement. Yes, Lieutenant Mike Farrell of the San Francisco police liked excitement. But he didn't expect to find any in the Yukon. He did, though. Mike and King and I went into a blind canyon after two crooks who were wanted for murder. There were hostile Indians at the opening of the canyon. The crooks were firing at us from excellent cover. And at that moment, we were attacked by a pack of starving wolves. There was plenty of excitement during the next few minutes, even more than Mike would have liked. Be sure to listen to this exciting adventure next Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Wednesday until September 12th, when we shall resume our regular Monday, Wednesday, and Friday broadcasts. This is Hal Neal wishing you goodbye and good luck.